This is where it all began, 400 years ago. It was August, 1619, aboard a Dutch ship. 20 Africans arrived here in Jamestown. Thus, the 400 year history of slavery and racism in America began. Let's begin with a question. And the question is this, what does history have to do with faith? Faith in God does not only apply to our individual ethics, but also to how institutions educate and how people learn. Christian educators insist that God is an integral part of the educational and learning process, inspiring curiosity and wonder, guiding seekers into a fuller understanding of truth, reminding leaders of the importance of humility and giving insight and wisdom in all things. God does all these things and more through the Holy Spirit and teachers with the end of producing people that are not conformed to the pattern of the world, but are transformed by the renewing of their minds. Because God is a part of the educational and learning process, I believe that there are certain attitudes, dispositions, and values that inform how we approach history as a field of study. I love history because it gives context that deepens your understanding of problems we face today. So when we study history as people of faith, what we learn impacts us personally and those around us. I like to think that the effects of learning are brought into public spaces like schools, churches, and communities by students whose minds have been renewed or repatterned. Jesus described this process in Matthew chapter five. He called his disciples the salt of the earth and the light of the world. These statements speak to our calling in the world and the role our example plays in people's ability to recognize God. You will notice in the passage the role our good works play in the credit and awareness of God that observers make. This is why I have identified biblical principles that inform how I study and apply history. Principles such as all humans created in the image of God, social justice, caring for the vulnerable, the golden rule, neighbor love, knowing the truth, believers having all things in common, self-examination in relation to others, and having a selfless attitude. These principles provide a biblical basis upon which this work is undertaken. In a small way, this work represents the best of a Christian approach to education and learning. In this documentary, black and white scholars, theologians, ethicists, and ministers connect these principles with the discipline of history to develop a Christian model of study long neglected in the church and the academy. This approach transcends the preoccupation with the who and the what of history. Instead, we focus on history as both a resource and a tool that models Christian belief in the world. I think you'll see in this documentary that history has a lot to do with faith. I took a trip to Jamestown, Virginia. It felt more like a pilgrimage as I journeyed to the place this history began. I stood by the Atlantic Ocean. I looked out over the James River. I felt the cold air and damp soil my ancestors felt and stood on 400 years ago. <laughs> 
Now, I've read hundreds of books on slavery, but standing here made the history real in a special way. It says John Rolfe, Virginia Tobacco Planter, the Secretary of the Colony of Virginia, documented the August 1619 arrival of the first Africans to land in Virginia at the nearby Old Point Comfort, which is the present day Hampton. In a letter to Sir Edwin Sandys, treasurer of the Virginia Company of London, Rolfe wrote that a Dutch man of war, actually an English privateer, the White Lion, brought not anything but twenty and odd Negroes. Governor George Yardley and the colony's Cape Merchant met the ship and gave its captain some victuals in exchange for the Africans. Three or four days later, another group of Africans arrived on the same ship, the treasurer. Afterwards, some of these first Africans were brought up to Jamestown. There is something sacred about memory, about looking back so we can understand how we got here today. I have spent over 10 years studying slavery and the ways it has intersected with Christianity. The references to slaves in the Bible have been interpreted by the church, and specifically the impact of slavery in America. With 2019 marking the 400 year anniversary of Africans in America, I wanted to take a different look at this issue. This documentary is not going to trace the long painful history of slavery, but rather provide a local look a local account of a community striving to understand and address the effects of this history. Before we take this local look at slavery in black and white, we must first look back to understand the institution of slavery from a historical and social standpoint. Let's begin with three important facts about slavery. Number one, slavery is an ancient practice. Nations such as Egypt, Greece, and Rome were slaveholding societies that used slave labor to build empires. America is a member of this group of nations. Number two, slavery at the fundamental level is a system of labor that exploits and dehumanizes large groups of people. While there are a few benefits and positive aspects of slavery for poor persons, the system itself is deeply problematic. Number three, Slaveholding societies learned to use the political system, violence, and religion to sustain enslavement for long periods of time. In fact, it is vital to pay attention to the role of religion in slaveholding societies, often justifying exploitation, violence, and pejorative beliefs about the enslaved. Now let's narrow our focus. Here are five facts about American slavery. Slavery in America began in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia, with the sale of 20 Africans to the colonists and ended between 1863 and 1865 with events such as the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War, and the ratification of the 13th Amendment. This is roughly a 246 year period. Number two, slavery in America evolved from a form of debt slavery in the early part of the colonial period for Africans, Europeans, and Native Americans to a racialized form of shadow slavery for millions of Africans. Shadow slavery was the dominant form of slavery in America. Number three, enslaved Africans and money from cheap labor built the economic, political, and social infrastructure of the country and created extensive wealth for whites while simultaneously shutting blacks out of systems and institutions their labor built. Number four, slavery divided three major Christian denominations, led to the creation of permanently segregated churches, and a bloody war that cost the lives of approximately 620,000 Americans. Number five, slavery morphs after 1865 in different ways through the black codes, Jim Crow segregation, thousands of lynchings, the creations of ghettos in the North, and convict leasing. These things led to another century of racial unrest confronted by the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King Jr and accompanying laws to address racism. Why is understanding slavery important? This history shows us two things. First, this history reveals the deeper, more fundamental problems with slavery. It is violent. 
It exploits masses of people, many times for generations. And it uses the political, social, and religious system to do it. Any society structured this way cannot quickly reverse itself or undo the damage exacted against those enslaved. Moving on or moving past this will take a considerable amount of time. Slavery and legal discrimination lasted over 300 years. That is three-fourths of the history of this country. This history is also important, secondly, because by coming to a basic understanding of how slavery works, it is essential in recognizing the ways slavery's shadow continues to hang over this nation today. In fact, African American leaders have emphasized the connection between slavery and the current plight of black Americans for over a century, and their work has mostly been ignored. The truth is, slavery's shadow and presence is still with us. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized that slavery had an impact on blacks in the 1950s and 60s. And today, leaders recognize that slavery in America was more than a historical fact or a historical period between 1619 and 1865, but rather had deeper social, psychological, ideological, religious, and spiritual roots that continue to affect us today. The unchristian, insensitive, and persistent push for African Americans to put slavery behind us for good reflects a profound level of ignorance of what was actually done and for how long. How can we simply put all this behind us? How is that even possible? Wright was one of a number of African Americans trying to understand and explain the American Holocaust we inherited. Today I continue that work, feeling and giving utterance to the full pain we inherited, but also adding to it by showing viewers how people are attempting to address and repair it. What both this history and African American leaders are trying to show us is that while slavery may be historical, its effects are still with us. In fact, understanding slavery gives context to the continuing problems associated with race and racism, and it provides insight into the disparities we currently see in the U.S. in the areas of wealth, education, health care, mental health, crime, and unemployment. Both now and for years to come, the challenge for churches will be 
to address and correct the effects of centuries of slavery. If you see that the effects of this history continue to be with us today, the question then is this, what are you going to do about it? What began in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 continues to impact this country. So we are here in the city of Louisville in the state of Kentucky. And I want you to see what it looks like for a local community to address the impact of slavery and racism in America. We're gonna meet with local pastors, community leaders, and educators who in different ways introduce this history and its impact on people in this community. We begin by asking African-American leaders to examine what the effects and legacy of slavery look like in their community. Um, I would say uh, I've identified really two areas that I think we're still dealing with. That would be um, with our black males in terms of development, um, identity, um, and how they relate to the world around them in terms of the United States and how they're treated. And I think that that has absolutely ties to slavery. Um, number two, I would say with our children. I think our um, family structure, family dynamic, has been negatively affected and it's carried on for years. Um, and that's one of the many challenges, especially when you pastor a church um, in a poor zip code, um, when, you, when you deal with individuals who don't quite understand that this issue is not a here and now issue. It's an issue that has been going on and has really um, infiltrated um, you know, our neighborhoods. I think that you could definitely see the residual effects uh, of that legacy of racism within the particular communities. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I think probably one of the most prevalent uh, kind of residual impacts is really what, what was the deconstruction of really our identity, you know, our African identity. You find a, a people that are really struggling with an identity crisis, and it, it manifests itself in all sorts of ways. The impact of slavery uh, in uh, the Russell community uh, is significant, and we see it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in how um, the people uh, think of themselves, but also how uh, this community has been um, uh, treated. Uh, we are in an area um, that has over 9,000 residents and in this particular area uh, the average uh, income for uh, many of the residents is about $15,000 uh, annually and the education level uh, is about uh, a 10th grade education and so all of those are uh, residual effects of, of slavery and uh, institutionalized racism uh, in um, uh, Metro Louisville. And we, we, we see the effects, the negative effects of slavery in how people uh, think of themselves. Uh, they have been um, told that um, the biggest expectation for them, many of them, and this was told to me directly, was for them to fail. And, and, and how do you tell somebody that? How do you live your life um, expecting not to be any better, or your circumstances to be any better than they are? Um, and, 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 and that is ingrained. Uh, in the mindset, and I think that is why we have some of the uh, the issues that we have as far as our youth and gang violence and 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 um, just um, that mentality uh, of not um, believing that you have value. So therefore, uh, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how. I carry myself because um, no more is expected of me anyway. The greatest manifestation of the legacy of racism is uh, the great economic gap that exists between residents in West Louisville, which is a high concentration of blacks live in West Louisville, and uh, those in the surrounding areas. Uh, West Louisville 
uh, was a community that experienced um, post World War II um, not only white flight but economic disinvestment uh, because of redlining. Louisville is like a donut. Um, on the surrounding areas, you had the white community. So think of a donut. Where, and in the middle, where there's nothing, is where you had a high concentration of black people. And those areas would be Parkland, Russell, and the California neighborhood. All around Louisville, the donut part, and, and the, the pun intended, where the dough is, that's where whites live. I think the greatest um, consequence of centuries of slavery and Jim Crow has been the great wealth gap. Um, black people are extremely poor and are separated in, from wealth. Uh, one report highlights that Louisville, Kentucky may be the third most segregated city as it relates to the poor and blacks having access and contact to people who have wealth. It is this recognition of slavery's effects that inform the different ways leaders in the black community attempt to address and repair the damage done. From a ministry standpoint, um, and I'll answer it like this, I have tried in the past and still try um, to really deal with the effects of slavery through mentorship with young men, young young ladies. And I say tried because, you know, here in Louisville, uh, as I'm sure in, in Lexington as well, we have so many young kids without fathers. Um, and walking around holding on to so much anger. And we've tried to really, really deal with that. But I've, I've recently had a shift in my, in my thinking. Mentorship is so important, but I think if we're going to deal or combat the effects of slavery, um, we have to deal with building wealth, building generational wealth. And that's sort of my new um, approach. Um, not that it's anything new to, to ministry, but it's something that I hadn't really given a lot of attention to the way I should. So I've, I've sort of shifted from mentorship, 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 to what can I do to put people um, in a generational wealth sort of building process. And that's a, that's a big one for me. That's what I'm in now. That whole identity conflict is one of the biggest things I see. So primarily, uh, one of the things I try to address in our preaching is always using the opportunities to highlight any African connections yeah. uh, within the Bible. I see so many people that are going astray just looking for that identity within the text. Mm -hmm. And there's so many opportunities mm -hmm. to make a connection and draw that line that many people aren't aware of. So that's one of the things I definitely do. You, you know, it's amazing. Um, and again, I don't know how it is in Lexington, but here in Louisville, I'm finding out that it's much easier to get money for mentorship, grant money, uh, funding sources. But you really run into an issue when you start presenting to these funding sources that you want to build generational wealth and that you want to affect. And all of a sudden, it becomes much more difficult. Um, and that really is what sent up the red flag. And I said, I must be on to something because <laughs> the folk don't mind us having after school programs. Right. Um, helping with homework and all that kind of stuff. But when you start talking about, again, generational wealth, it's almost as if that is sort of off limits. And, uh, and that's been very, very concerning. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's a challenge. And I think um, when you talk about the effects of slavery, um, that is one of the main issues. Even when slavery was quote unquote over, we came out of slavery with no wealth, no land, nothing. I think another big thing uh, that we see as well with the connection to slavery is just the trauma, yeah, right? The yeah. ongoing trauma and how that is generation after generation. Mm -hmm. And again, it affects so many different areas of a person's life from just their relationship to their faith, yes. to their economics, to you know almost everything. And we don't deal with it. Right. It's, it's never been dealt with, mm -hmm. right? So even, I think, using uh, ministry and church to even speak to the, mm -hmm. you know, just the, the counseling that is necessary right, to right. deal with that pain that people are overcoming. To at St. Peter's slash Molo to um, deal with these issues is, um, we recognize that to live in uh, our work in urban Louisville, you cannot ignore the ills of this community. You can't ignore that. Um, people are undereducated, that uh, we live in a food desert where 
Um, you know, there's no, the local grocery store is the family dollar store. Uh, we, we can't ignore that um, many of our people um, are uh, in recovery, either through from alcoholism or um, um, drug addiction. We can't ignore that 60% uh, of our residents have some connection to the justice cabinet, either through uh, them being incarcerated or family members being incarcerated. Uh, our neighbors, and so to to ignore that for me says that we are ignoring um, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we have to uh, we have a responsibility to be God's hands and feet in this community, uh, and to help make a difference. Um, and so we do that through our mission, uh, where we um, uh, have partnered with um, Dare to Care, which is the uh, local food bank of Feed America, uh, where we have distributed an, uh, annually 160,000 pounds of food uh, to over 13,000 uh, people. Uh, and we do this every week. Um, we can, uh, we have recovery uh, where we have three meetings a week where uh, uh, roughly 400 men and women gather uh, so that they can either go through a a um, Christian-based recovery program or a, a traditional 12-step program. Uh, we have a reentry uh, program, a 12-week and a 12-month uh, program where men and women come every Monday so that they can um, deal with their emotional life skills, um, which is a seven-week program where they can go uh, get the basics, uh, reading, uh, math, uh, reading comprehension, where they can do um, basic computer learning, uh, where they deal with mindfulness or art therapy. Uh, just things that we hope will help these men and women transition um, back into the community in a healthy way. And so uh, we, we um, uh, uh, address um, uh, the, the realities of racism uh, and the effects of slavery in a whole lot of different ways. How can a black pastor, college president, seek to redress centuries of injustice. Um, well, I think I attempt to do three things. Number one, I think, especially this is, I think it's a historic group of black church, and that's personal transformation, uh, group empowerment, and social justice, and all those are connected. And I think that it, what is foundational for black leadership is social justice. And by social justice, I mean, uh, first of all, being honest about America's racial past. America likes to cover it up. America likes to hide it. America likes to deny that it never existed. We do a la carte history in which we just select certain parts of history that helps to drive our narrative. Instead of looking at history through the lenses of history's victims, the fact of the matter is, is that what America has done to black people constitutes a crime against humanity based on the United Nations standards of crimes against humanity. We need to call it what it is. It is a crime against humanity. Social justice means repairing the descendants of slaves and Jim Crow people. There's a bill, Sheila Jackson Lee uh, has introduced recently the bill that was uh, first um, crafted by Congress, who was the former congressman from the Detroit area, uh, uh, H.R. 40, which is calling for just the study of reparations, and it has never been able to get a hearing uh, on, the, on, on, on the floor of the Congress. This is not a call for reparations. This is just a call for the study of reparations. And I think the great sin uh, of, of, of America, especially the church, is the absence of historical curiosity. We should be asking, we should be curious enough to ask the questions, why are things the way they are? 
The reason they do not want to study that bill is because they don't want to find out the reason things the way, are the way they are. Because once you know the truth, then you you are you have the burden of doing something about it. And it's it, the debt uh, Crow Randall Robinson is so huge, it's so monumental, we don't even know how to pay it. Um, so that whole social justice piece, uh, speaking truth to power, helping uh, uh, both the public sector and the private sector to create an even playing field uh, for all peoples. There is something special happening in the city of Louisville. Not only are African American leaders talking about the history of slavery and racism, leaders in white churches are doing it as well. I met with two pastors and asked them why it is important for white churches to understand the history of slavery and racism in America. Lewis, uh, it's been important for me personally to learn about the history of slavery and to come to uh, a deeper awareness of uh, the gravity of, of what happened long ago, but also how that continues to impact our world today. So it seemed important to, to us, uh, especially as white Christians, to begin to look honestly at the question of uh, how have we benefited, what happened, uh, how, how can we begin to make repair of what uh, has transpired in the past, how can we learn from the past, how can we grow from the past. You can't, you can't repent of what you don't face. And so I think every generation of white people is going to have to face the reality of uh, slavery that uh, was built into the very uh, DNA of our country and uh, begin to, f and then for their generation to find ways to make changes so that we have equality in America. Well, it's important because it's part of our own spiritual discipline. Uh, we must remember, uh, and this is what Christ calls us to do when we go to the table. Um, when we partake of the bread and the cup, we are called to remember. And if we don't remember, then we refuse to even look at the ugly parts of our own history. How we were complicit um, and even our silence perpetuated evil within the world. And for the white church to understand that means we have to go further back into history, even beyond our own American history of slavery, but all the way back into understanding Christendom and how our white theolo theology was pushed onto people inappropriately, often used with violence, in order to conform them to our way of being. And this is rooted in bad theology, in bad language, language that has been twisted, uh, where the church only sees God in one dimension. And that has gone on for centuries. And so I wonder if the white church was willing to even expand our language, our understanding of how God works in the world, then maybe our own hearts will be changed in the process. These pastors experienced personal transformation that they invited their congregations to also experience. When I uh, began to have my eyes opened about the larger implications of racism and uh, uh, white privilege, uh, to truly see at a deeper level all the realities of that. Uh, it did begin to impact my preaching, the kind of stories I told, uh, the way that we as a predominantly white congregation began to look at the world. Uh, Jesus came to the world, one of his uh, favorite miracles, if you will, was opening the eyes of the blind. And I think that's more than just a literal event that happened. I think it's a metaphor for people having the opportunity to see the reality of life more clearly. And that's what happened to me four years ago uh, when I began my friendship with uh, Dr. Kevin Cosby, when we read the book uh, uh, Black Power, and when uh, the, the dots began to connect and I began to see what I couldn't have seen any at any time in my past. That old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Uh, apparently I was ready and there was a convergence with 
Kevin Cosby and Empower West, and it all came together. Um, when a pastor sees something, he or she can't help but share with the congregation and be, invite them into this seeing, because the seeing is painful, but it's also liberating. As a white person, it's like, oh, I, I get it now. The world makes a bit more sense. You feel more connected to the world. You also have to then begin to make some repairs. But that feels good, too. It feels good to me to do the things that are right and true and good, that connect with God and the world. So uh, to begin to talk about making repairs uh, 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 heals me, it heals my church, it heals the world. So, yeah, I I shared that with my church. We went through an anti-racism workshop, and uh, 75 people uh, came on a Saturday and spent from 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the afternoon talking, confronting their racism. And it was we were all white, and we were led by people of color, and it was transformative. I would recommend every predominantly white church have a conversation like that. So I cannot ask the congregation to do the hard work I'm refusing to do. So... I've been at Mutual Park Baptist Church for two and a half years now. Uh, the first year I spent working privately on my own with a group called Empower West. They are a group of pastors, black and white pastors, coming together to empower the West End, the poor black community of Louisville, Kentucky. So it was there that I had to wrestle with my own demons, to wrestle with my own family history, my own lineage. And that takes a lot of soul work to do. But if I was going to ask the congregation to go in a direction that I had not yet been, I feel like it would be almost unethical for me to do that from the pulpit. So for the first year, I had to figure out my own story and how I was even wrapped up in embedded racism and kind of white supremic acts that run throughout the lineage of not only my family, but also my Baptist heritage. So after a year, I started using the pulpit as a place to begin conversation and even changing language, describing Jesus with brown skin. To explicitly say that takes the imagination to another realm for a white congregation or to even use words like hate crime after there's a violent act against our black brothers and sisters. To use language is one way that we help see transformation take place. It's hard because it's one thing to say it in the pulpit, it's another thing to interact in conversation with people, mainly white people, who have never been asked to do this type of hard soul work. Because this is the work of redemption. And what I told the congregation from the beginning is, if we are not willing to go to the cross, then we have no business at the tomb of resurrection. And part of us going to the cross is practicing confession, practicing repentance, that then leads us to participating in God's redemptive work. So when I first started preaching about racism, um, about white supremacy, about hate crimes, uh, um, the response uh, was a little, you know, bristly. Uh, (laughs) Some of the folks did not want to hear it, and they even told me explicitly, I did not come to church to hear about these political issues. But then when I would push back and say, these are not political issues, these are human issues, human issues that have been perpetuated by a false religion, it started getting them thinking about it. Uh, um, But it takes time. It takes time and hard work and a whole lot of trust in the Spirit of God to do what God does best, redeem people, even people like me. Slavery is a highly sensitive and taboo topic in white churches. Reverend Phelps and Reverend Whitaker provide insight into a compelling way they broached this topic and brought their congregations along with them. I asked these pastors what role personal narrative plays and how they approach this sensitive topic? That's a great question for me. Um, going back and uh, examining my own story, my own narrative, 
uh, was uh, one of the ways that my eyes got opened, Lewis. Um, I began to uh, recognize that even though both of my parents came from poverty, my mother came from an orphanage, my father from Eastern, uh, from uh, West Virginia in the uh, in the Appalachian area. Uh, but uh, even though they came from those places of poverty, they had privilege because they were white. And as I began to unpack my own story, I began to see how I had privilege and others didn't. And if it happened for me, I think it's happened for everyone. So me telling my story has helped helped other people with their own narrative um, to uh, recognize privilege, to recognize uh, points of racism within one's own uh, thinking, and to begin to heal those places and uh, uh, trust that um, even though it feels risky to enter into this hard conversation about race, well, you, you and I know the more we've done it, the closer we've gotten and the more real this gets. And I love that. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Using I language is crucial. When, when you're talking about sensitive topics, topics that dehumanize people if they're not willing to be spoken aloud. Um, so when I was doing the hard work of my own history, I found in my own narrative that there were Southern Baptist great-great uncles who were pastors in Kentucky who were around the same time as the Civil War who promoted slavery. Like that that personal narrative of history is haunting for me and really shame-filled. Um, and it took me a long time before I could actually speak it aloud. Um, but knowing that that was there, and then also seeing how that was generationally transmitted over the years on a number of topics, has become helpful to enter into the narrative of the congregation. This congregation is 90 years old. It was founded as a Southern Baptist church. We cannot neglect our own narrative. So speaking from my own personal Baptist narrative and some of the ugliness that came with it was a way for us to connect, to intersect together in the hard work of redeeming our own wounded selves. And once the congregation, and perhaps some are still coming along, which is fine, uh, once they realize that, you know, this is a hard com conversation for me personally to have, they realize that I'm a human being and not coming above and over them, but below and with them in the hard work of looking at our own kind of racial reconciliation work that we need to do. Uh, so saying these stories out loud are a way that we engage in our own humanity, both good and bad. There are two major African-American leaders, intellectuals, who are well known, but the substance of their thought is often misunderstood because it is not viewed through the context and lens of slavery. So I interviewed two scholars who have focused their work on these two leaders and their importance for Christians today. For now going on 25 years, I've not found a more relevant voice uh, about the hypocrisy that stems from not just racism, but the white supremacy behind racism. So there are a lot of relevant voices and important voices, and I try to keep up with them, but there is something about Douglas during the period in which he lived that he casts a kind of gaze forward. Uh, and he kind of shows that we can, as a nation, go down separate paths. One is the path to live into our fundamental freedoms and aspirations as a nation uh, and obligations and uh, virtues as religious people. The other path is to live into the worst of our biases and racism and, uh, and it's because of that gaze that I think Douglas is particularly relevant because we can look back and say this man called this in the 1840s and we're still dealing with this today. So the more I read about Douglas, the more relevant I find him. And it's interesting that uh, Benjamin Quarles wrote a definitive biography of Frederick Douglass 
in the 1940s. And just last year, David Blight wrote a spectacular biography, an intellectual biography of Frederick Douglass. So 70 years later, right, scholars are still finding information and material about one of the greatest Americans. Why are the writings of Frederick Douglass important for churches and pastors? In, in other words, why should churches in the National Baptist Convention of America, the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, why should they read the writings of Douglass as they try to help the church imagine a new trajectory for the next 400 years? So Douglass talked about the church, and he talked extensively uh, about churches and the kind of hypocrisy that churches are not immune to. So that there were churches that could preach the gospel uh, and yet still participate in slavery. There were churches that would uh, take up the cause of bringing Bibles to Africa, but you could not say a word on behalf of the liberation of the slaves in those churches. So Douglas spoke extensively about that. And I think it's up for us today, up to us to, to listen to those words in our context and think about the ways in which churches today might still be participating in those kinds of biases. If I may, there's a quote that I'd like to read from uh, Frederick Douglass uh, on the decline of true religion. And here's what he says. I believe the grand reason why we have slavery in this land at the present moment is that we are too religious as a nation. In other words, that we have substituted religion for humanity. We have substituted a form of godliness, an outside show for the real thing itself. We have houses built for the worship of God, which we regard as too sacred to plead the cause of the downtrodden millions in them. They will tell you in these churches that they are willing to receive you to talk to them about the sins of the scribes and the Pharisees or on the subject of the heathenism of the South Sea Islanders. But the very minute you ask them to open their mouths for the liberation of the southern slaves, they tell you that is a subject with which they have nothing to do and which they do not wish to have introduced into the church. It is foreign to the object for which churches in this country were formed and houses built. If the liberation of God's children is foreign to the reason why churches were built, then why were those churches built? That's why Frederick Douglass is important for people, church people today, to read and to wrestle with. The truth is, you cannot understand the church of the 1950s and 60s without understanding the role slavery played in America and the social system that emerged after its demise in 1865. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most influential Christian leaders in American history. His work and thought only make sense when viewed within the broader context of systemic oppression in America. Well, Dr. King's primary mission was to challenge the, the system of segregation in the Deep South. And the system of segregation in the Deep South was rooted in the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. So Jim Crow segregation uh, and the system of segregation in the Deep South all emerged out of the, the enduring uh, systemic evil of slavery. Understanding slavery as that primary institution that existed for nearly 300 years in American society, shaped and formed the cultural milieu that Dr. King was challenging and sought to overcome in his life and in his legacy. So in the crucible of slavery was when this nation was forced into a consciousness of racial division, of violence, and this, in this, this legacy of dividing human beings on the basis of their, the color of their skin. So when Dr. King stood up in 1963 and said that his dream is to one day live in a nation where people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, he was speaking directly to the history of the slave experience that had laid the foundation for how we often view each other in American society. So slavery and the system of slavery 
which was, in fact, a, a legal, political, and a spiritual disruption of human community laid the foundation for much of what Dr. King was trying to do in, in his life and in his work. If you think about the opening of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, the first few statements that Dr. King made actually provide deeper insight into the impact of slavery and the system of segregation that he sought to upend. So in that historic speech in August of 1963, under the hot blazing sun, uh, Dr. King spoke to over three of three or four hundred thousand individuals where he called um, forth the conversation to say that we have been issued a blank check, a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. And so we gather to together today to help call America to live up to its creeds, live up to its promises, and to be true to its word and what it, what, what it put on paper. And so the challenge of, of advancing uh, racial justice or human community or equality is taking on the history of slavery and the slave experience that continues to invade our current body politic. It continues to show up in present realities because it shaped the foundation for how we understand much of, of, um, uh, of, of, of our culture today. Both Hill and Williamson show us how to use history to not only provide context on today, but also to use past insight to help us see clearly the challenges before us. Frederick Douglass has a quote at the end of his autobiography where he draws a very sharp distinction between the Christianity of the slaveholders and the Christianity Jesus represents. Listen to William's reflection on this quote and why his criticism is so important if white and black churches are going to address the deeper reasons for segregated churches. It's a passage that Douglas uses any number of occasions. You will see over time that he kind of pol uh, polishes the, the quote that he uses. The fullest expression, though, is found at the end of his narrative, the first of his autobiographies. And as I like to say, let's go to the primary source. Here's what Douglas says. I love the religion of our blessed Savior. I love that religion that comes from above in the wisdom of God, which is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I love that religion that sends its votaries to bind up the wounds of him that has fallen among thieves. I love that religion that makes it the duty of its disciples to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. I love that religion that is based upon the glorious principle of love to God and love to man, which makes its followers do unto others as they themselves would be done by. It is because I love this religion that I hate the woman-whipping, the mind-darkening, the soul-destroying religion that exists in the southern states of America. It is because I regard the one as good and pure and holy that I cannot but regard the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. Loving the one, I must hate the other. Holding to the one, I must reject the other. Douglas is doing a lot here. So part of what he's doing is a sort of a theological exposition uh, in which he is looking at what does God reveal about how we should live. And let's identify what God reveals and contrast that to how we actually live from the perspective of slaves. Now by doing so, what Douglas does is he disallows the kind of uh, colloquialisms that look at the uh, peculiar institution is just a cultural practice. And he, he draws a line in the sand. He lays down the gauntlet and says, if this is what God says we should do, then what is happening is not God. So his love and hatred really correlates to what is revealed and what has not been revealed, what is under God's yes and what is under God's no. And Douglas does this with clarity and a forcefulness to affect change in people. Which side are you on? Right? And we see that 
uh, in the civil rights movement. We see that in movements today. Which side are you on? So what Douglas does in terms of religion is to lay down what, what God has revealed and what we do that in no way is what God intends. But he does more than that. Douglas also is making a kind of cultural and social critique. He is identifying, laying bare, uh, shining a light on white superiority uh, and how white superiority plays itself out in religion so that no one can say, well, this is just cultural practice. Uh, this is somehow apart from religion. This has nothing to do with religion. This is just a social practice. Douglas is critiquing that very culture as well as being implicit, as being caught up with uh, a false practice of Christianity. So not only the praxis culturally is faulty, but the ideology, the tenets upon which that culture are based, also faulty and not coming from God. It's a masterful expression. White academics have a sacred responsibility to speak to these issues as well. The conversation about slavery and racism must happen in both communities and both need bold leaders to wade into the history and its effects. It is particularly important for academics to bring this history into the classroom where minds and passions are formed and nurtured to serve the world. As Christians, we are called and commanded to love God and neighbor and that is the opposite of systemic racism. And we cannot live into our Christian identity while we continue to inhabit and support implicitly, often without our conscious consent, uh, ways of being in the world and systems that harm our neighbors and our kin and kith. So we need to learn in order to fulfill our own identity as Christians, in order to follow Jesus. And we can't start from here and, and uh, do things right without figuring out how we got here. How did we get in this situation? And I am astonished by my own level of ignorance and the level of ignorance of most white folks in America. We have not been taught, it wasn't in the school books. Uh, Mississippi appendectomy was not covered in social studies. Mm -hmm. you know, lynching was not on the list of things we studied in high school. And without knowing that history, we can't understand what's happening right now, let alone uh, work and move towards God's future, the future that God intends for us. Again, because it is part of the world we live in right now, our neighbors and loved ones, friends and family are hurting right now. Our students are hurting, our churches are hurting, and as Christians, we're called to love God and neighbor. We gotta look at that hurt. We gotta try and change the world and make it more just. Um, so we have to wrestle with the history. Dr. Craig O'Snell discusses the different responses of students when they are introduced to this history in the classroom. She contrasts how African-American students respond with the response of white students. For some of my African-American students, of course, it's very painful. Uh, this is not easy history. It can be helpful to have it validated in a classroom and even by a white professor. Not that my voice is more authoritative, but to have someone outside the black community say, yes, it is not in the textbooks for high school, but it is in the history books. We do, uh, the, the whole world knows this happened. Um, so it can be helpful, I think, in that way. Often my African-American students will uh, elaborate on what I know and teach me more about whatever topic we're, we're covering. For a lot of white students, it's complete surprise. They just had no idea. They um, sometimes wanna say, well, that couldn't be, that, that can't be right. Why didn't I know that? Surely that wasn't the case. Um, and there's a fair amount of um, kinda 
falling into silence that isn't uh, that isn't wanting to not hear anymore but is just trying to process all of this and then out of that silence comes all kinds of questions about um, what it, what can we do to change the future many times what ends up happening when white christians are introduced to this history is they get stuck in guilt dr craig O'Snell co-authored a book to show people ways they can stand in solidarity stand alongside people that have been marginalized in ways that allow them to be authentic to be able to own and acknowledge their privilege their ignorance but to not leave them stuck in guilt the book is called uh, No Innocent Bystanders, Becoming an Ally in the Struggle for Justice. It's co-authored with Christopher Dusso, a Catholic theologian and activist. We're both white people. We're both fairly clueless, but less clueless than we used to be. So it is an invitation, primarily written for other white Christians, to learn some of the history and to be able to frame it theologically. We tend to think in terms of innocence and guilt, and it's a model that's based on our criminal justice system. Did someone intend to do it? Did they do it? Were they coerced to do it? That kind of way of thinking. If you do that, that, kind of, that model just isn't helpful when you're talking about large societal structural issues. I didn't invent racism. I, I'm not guilty of starting it. At the same time, I can't say I'm innocent of it because I participate in a world that's steeped in it. So the concepts of innocent and innocence and guilt really don't fully address large communal problems. Happily, as Christians, we've got really good concepts for this. We have the concept of grace that God loves us and offers each and all of us a vocation of communion with God and neighbor and the world, that call to love God and neighbor. That's grace, and that's the starting point. And within that, we recognize that we don't do it well. We miss the mark. We move away from what we're called towards. We sin. And that sin is both individual, and yeah, there are times when I do it really wrong. And it's communal. It's broken structures um, like mass incarceration, like um, the, the, the New Deal, you know, structures that were put in place that keep uh, racism going. So the good news is um, if you're in, in a place of guilt, there's not really much you can do. You feel guilty. Do you ask to be punished? Do you just fit, feel bad about yourself? Guilt doesn't motivate much. But if you know that you're broken, if you know that you're sinful, well, we have ways of dealing with that in Christian theology, particularly in the Reformed tradition um, that I am part of. First is you acknowledge that, you, that this is true. You tell the truth about the situation. In the United States right now, if we as a whole nation acknowledged the horrible history of racism and the ongoing structures that support it, that would be life-changing. That, that would not be a small thing. But you don't just acknowledge it and say you're sorry, then you turn around and re, um, reorient yourself towards the goal of uh, loving God and neighbor. So that, that two-fold move of acknowledging and course correcting is repentance. And repentance is the Christian response to sinfulness. We know we're sinful. We're not just stuck wallowing in it. We've got a path to take, and it's one of repentance. And I think that that is good news for white Christian churches. We're not just stuck knowing that our ancestors created a system that harms our neighbors and sort of benefits us even while it erodes our souls. We actually, God has offered a way forward for all of us. Some leaders, black and white, in the city of Louisville are committed to making a small difference in the national scourge of systemic racism. This documentary is a product of some of this work among Baptists to address the history of slavery.
The initiative is called the Angela Project. The Angela Project is an initiative developed by Dr. Kevin Cosby, president of Simmons College of Kentucky. That's one of the reasons why we instituted the Angela Project. The Angela Project, I, I knew that uh, uh, several years ago that the 400th anniversary of Blacks in America was, was, was upon us. So I wanted to help draw attention to the evils of slavery, the legacy of slavery. 400 years ago, we were brought here as slaves. We have been enslaved in the Americas longer than we've been free. I mean, I want you to think about that. We, you know, we've been free, semi-freedom. We're not free now. Uh, and, um, uh, we are, um, slavery, as someone has said, has evolved. So uh, we, were, we were enslaved for 246 years. Slavery has been over 153 years. And when I say slavery, I mean that form of slavery because it has evolved into new forms from um, uh, convict leasing to sharecropping to uh, Jim Crow and segregation to the ghettoization of blacks through redlining, um, through mass incarceration, uh, through the destruction of black wealth with the housing crisis of, of the uh, late uh, 20th century. All of black, most black wealth is in their homes. And uh, we, we, got, we came late to home wealth and that is because we were blocked out of what whites had been privileged to have for decades, and whites just don't realize it. And blacks, many of them don't realize it. So our wealth is in our houses and our stocks. So when the housing bubble hit us and people were losing their homes, that devastated black wealth to the point that uh, the housing, black house home ownership is at the levels that it was during the Great Depression. So um, the whole purpose of the Angela Project was to educate people about the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in hopes that we can set a new trajectory for race in America within the next 100 years. Um, unfortunately, that was my hope and that was my dream, but it seems like that what we did the first 400 years, uh, there are those people who want to uh, commit to, maintain, to maintaining white supremacy and black disadvantage. The Angela Project is a sign of hope in very troubling times. It doesn't promise to solve all the problems slavery and racism created, but it does represent a concerted effort of Christians to work for change from a place of radical honesty. And this work is inspiring hope a sober kind of hope we need to begin a new chapter in American history.